If it's Tuesday, we're following breaking news as former President Trump and 2024 Republican presidential frontrunner reveals he is a target of the special counsel's investigation into efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Plus, an American soldier is being detained in North Korea after U.S. officials say he willfully bolted across the demilitarized zone and into the communist country without authorization. And Ron DeSantis meets the press with a news conference in South Carolina as the presidential candidate tries to retool his campaign and potentially seize on Trump's legal troubles. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington, where we're following breaking news as the former president is once again bracing for another indictment and potential arrest. This morning, Donald Trump publicly stated and NBC News federal law enforcement sources confirmed he is formally a target of the special counsel's criminal investigation into January 6th and efforts to interfere with the 2020 election. The special counsel's office informed Trump as part of a target letter on Sunday. The former president says he's been given four days to report to the grand jury, which almost always means an arrest and indictment. A spokesperson for the special counsel's office declined to comment. To be clear, we don't know when Mr. Trump could face charges or what exactly those charges might be. The former president accused the special counsel of trying to interfere with his current presidential candidacy. And in a familiar move, Republicans on Capitol Hill today echoed those attacks. Here's House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Well, I guess uh, under a Biden administration, Biden America, you'd expect this. If you noticed recently, President Trump went up in the polls and was uh, actually surpassing President Biden for re-election. So what do they do now? Weaponize government to go after their number one opponent. It's time and time again. I think the American public is tired of this. They want to have see equal justice. And the idea that they utilize this to go after those who politically disagree with them is wrong. Now, as this is all unfolding, lawyers for Mr. Trump and special counsel Smith appeared in court today amid disagreements on when and how Mr. Trump will be tried on those 37 felony counts tied to his mishandling of classified documents. It also comes as two grand juries in Georgia decide whether to indict him on criminal charges related to his efforts to interfere in the state's 2020 election results. And as he awaits trial in Manhattan on criminal charges tied to hush money payments he made to an adult film star in 2016. Joining me now to break this all down, Ken Delaney, an NBC justice and intelligence correspondent, Vaughn Hilliard on all things Trump, and Laura Jarrett, NBC senior legal correspondent. So, Ken, uh, let's start with this target letter. What do we know about it? Has anyone else in Mr. Trump's orbit received their own letters? It's not clear, Kristen. Garrett, uh, Hack, and I have done some reporting, and we've made calls on this to likely other people that may be uh, under consideration for charges, and we have not learned that anybody else has gotten a target letter. But what the target letter for Mr. Trump means is that he is almost certainly going to be indicted in this case. And uh, the letter said that he had four days as of Sunday when he got it to, um, to appear before the grand jury to sort of um, make his last stand to, if he wanted to say anything. Uh, and of course, nobody, neither the prosecution nor the defense, expects that to happen. It's not a requirement. It's an opportunity. Uh, it would be legally perilous for him to, to talk to this grand jury. But what it signals is that what we've been hearing, the rumblings and the observations that legal experts have been making in recent weeks, that this case about uh, the lawful transfer of power being impeded, this investigation was picking up steam and was moving towards a conclusion, that appears to have come to fruition. Um, and what a lot of legal experts we talk to believe is happening here is a complex conspiracy case uh, involving potential charges of obstruction of an official proceeding or a conspiracy to defraud the U.S. government. And the theory of that case would be uh, former President Trump and others knew that Trump lost the election but made bogus allegations of fraud and tried to use the levers of government and tried to raise money and tried to uh, voice slates of false electors in a way to delay or stop the transfer of power to Joe Biden. Now we'll have to see exactly what that indictment says if it comes, Kristen. We will have to wait and see. Ken, before I get to Vaughn and Laura, and I do want to do that momentarily, you were there in court, Judge Eileen Cannon, uh, basically hearing arguments about when the hearings and the court uh, cases could actually start in the classified documents case. Tell us what happened in court. 
Yeah, it was about an hour, 45 minute hearing. It, it just concluded not long ago. And the upshot is the judge did not rule. But what I can tell you is she appeared to brush aside and dismiss the arguments from President Trump's lawyers that he can't get a fair trial while he's running for president and that therefore the entire trial should be put off until after the November election. But, however, she appeared to be quite sympathetic to the idea that this is an incredibly complex case. There's a huge volume of documents and video and classified documents that, the, that Trump's lawyers are only now getting and have to grapple with. And that for that reason, and also for legal reasons, uh, the trial could not proceed as quickly as special counsel Jack Smith wants it to, which would be uh, December. So again, she hasn't ruled, but that's reading the tea leaves and the questions that she asked the lawyers. There was also, though, a really heated exchange that's worth noting, Kristen, mm -hmm. between the special counsel's office and Donald Trump's lawyers about whether this case and whether Donald Trump should be treated like any other defendant. And the special counsel said it's a bedrock of our Constitution, David Harbach, the, one of the lead lawyers, and, and, it's, and it's a bedrock of our system that former President Trump is not the president. He's just like anybody else who's been indicted, and he should be treated that way. His lawyers disagree. They say, no, he's running for president now, and the administration of his opponent is prosecuting him, and therefore this case is different. And, and Harbach stood back up and said, that's absolutely false. The special counsel was appointed to, infl to insulate this case from politics. Everybody on the special counsel's team is a career appointee. And so that was an interesting exchange, a clash of narratives about the fundamental nature of this prosecution, Kristen. Just absolutely fascinating, Ken. Incredible that you were in the courtroom there and could bring us that just moments after it finished. Vaughn, let me turn to you because former President Trump says he received this letter on Sunday, and yet we're not learning about it until today. What do you make of the delay? Is this an attempt to effectively try to pre -butt? Clearly, he wants to control the narrative here. We've seen this in his uh, other previous indictments. Especially under the uh, four-day, uh, essentially, timeline that he says that the special counsel's office has provided him to go before the grand jury. That would be, of course, Thursday. The outstanding question is whether he were to agree to go and testify before that grand jury. Of course, uh, that would be made a part of the record if they were to choose to, in fact, charge him. But this would uh, suggest for Donald Trump uh, uh, a several-day period in which he and his advisors are able to calculate how they want to uh, not only legally defend him, but politically go on the offensive with this. You saw this in these posts, and you have seen Donald Trump do this in the past. And over the last two and a half years, not only has he defended his actions on uh, January 6th, but also leading up to them, and he has even uh, uh, repeatedly suggested that he would potentially pardon January 6th defendants. Of course, now you're, he's looking at the potential that he could be one of those defendants himself. Mm. Look, Vaughn, it has just been so striking because after the first two indictments, we have seen Republicans largely rally around him, save a few who've cr criticized him, Chris Christie, for example. Is he betting on that continuing? Look, I mean, look where Chris Christie and Asa Hutchinson are in mm -hmm. the polls right now. Uh, they only have a few percentage points of support. Ron DeSantis today, notably, he suggested that the, perhaps there was more that Donald Trump could have done on the actual day of the attack while he was in the White House. And immediately, the Trump campaign, uh, multiple advisors began posting on Twitter, calling out uh, Ron DeSantis. And one advisor, Jason Miller, posting uh, with the caption, quote, Ron DeCheney. Uh, you know, this harkens back to last year. I traveled around this country, and not only did Donald Trump repeatedly talk about January 6th in the 2020 election, but he did all he could to take out Republicans who had voted to impeach him because of the events of that day. And, of course, Liz Cheney was his number one target. And, you know, Jack Smith, he doesn't run a political operation. Liz Cheney, Tom Rice, uh, Republicans uh, who voted to impeach Donald Trump, they were. They were running political campaigns uh, to convince the Republican electorates in their districts that they were in the right to investigate Donald Trump in the lead up to January 6th. And ultimately, those Republicans, uh, they lost in key primaries to folks who were running with the endorsement of Donald Trump. So Donald Trump has done this. Granted, it wasn't with his name on the ballot, but he had success in uh, up and down the ballot in 2022. And he clearly believes that he can make an offensive political game out of this at the same time that his legal counsel is trying to defend him in the courts.
Vaughn, no one's busier on the trail than you are, my friend. Thank you for that. And, and oh, by the way, you're coming back later in the show. So appreciate it. I'll let you get some rest in between. <laughs> we'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs> see you in just a few minutes. <laughs> Laura Jarrett, let me turn to you. Let's talk about uh, the legal perspective here. I mean, what should we be making of this target letter? Is it confirmation that an indictment is imminent or is that reading too much into it? I think it raises the um, prospect of the likelihood of the indictment coming, but the question is one of timing, Kristen. Mm -hmm. um, the, as many federal prosecutors will tell you, in their experience, if they send out a target letter, it's very serious. Had there, of course, been examples where someone actually didn't get indicted even though they received that letter? Sure. But Jack Smith is not sending the president, former president of the United States a target letter and then not going to indictment. That's just not going to happen. The question is one of timing, as you mentioned, and also so what charges he could possibly be facing. We remember with the classified documents probe, we reported that he received a target letter, but that actually came several weeks before the grand jury actually returned that indictment. So I don't think we should expect to see an indictment necessarily this week. It might take a little bit. There might be a lag for whatever reason. As for the actual charges, Ken laid out some of the, the um, actual skeleton there, really does focus on his efforts to cling to power, his efforts to obstruct the official proceeding, which would be the certification of the election. We remember this whole scheme that he and his allies concocted was to actually put pressure on the former vice president to somehow either block the certification or pause it, delay it, anything like that and also send up these phony slates of electors. We've seen reporting now different secretaries of state, different officials at the state level in those battleground states talking to the special counsel. That's why, because those states were receiving these phony slates of electors. And so, of course, the special counsel wants to know more about that. Those, again, are just the tea leaves that we can sort of <laughs> read and piece together based on the witnesses and what they're being asked. But, of course, only Jack Smith and, and his team knows what they actually would plan to charge here. And so that's that's what we need more reporting on. Yeah, we are in tea leaf land, that is for sure. You know, it's interesting because Mr. Trump said that he was invited to appear before the grand jury. Uh, walk us through the thinking there. Does he have to appear? Would we anticipate he would appear? Because he hasn't in the past, right? He doesn't have to appear. He's not going to appear. I cannot imagine any circumstances <laughs> under which his attorneys would ever let him appear. Uh, you should basically think about this as sort of a box checking pro forma exercise that is done just, uh, you know, to play it particularly by the book. I can definitely think of circumstances in which I got on the phone with the government in my previous life and talk to them about, are you going to charge my client? Is my co client considered a target? You don't actually have to send somebody a target letter in order to charge them. But if you're playing it by the book, under the Justice Department protocols, uh, there's ways in which uh, you can understand why Jack Smith wants to play this by the book. So he's sending this letter, but it, it's really more of a just pro forma box checking exercise. Yeah. The former president is not going to go into the grand jury. <laughs> okay. I, it could not be more definitive there, Laura. Thank you for that definitive answer. Let me ask you both. Before I let you go, and Ken, let me start with you. What can you tell us about the scope of this probe, understanding that we don't know all of the details? Uh, but as Laura kind of mapped out, there are some key potential charges that Mr. Trump could be facing. Just how broad is this investigation? I guess the answer, Kristen, is broader than we first thought. And remember, there was a time when, you know, the January 6th committee in Congress laid out all this evidence and people were saying, where's the Justice Department? Well, now we know where the Justice Department was. They, they've conducted a really thorough and broad investigation of, based on the public reporting, right? Reports of people being subpoenaed to the grand jury, leaks from defense lawyers. We know, for example, that they've looked into not only the many slates of fake electors that were put forth in various states, but also the efforts to fundraise around that and, and potentially whether there was any fraud. Um, and, and really this question, it's a really important avenue of inquiry. Did, did Donald Trump know or should he have known that he lost the election or did he have willful blindness to that fact? In other words, did enough people tell him, like we know that, for example, his Attorney General Bill Barr did, that he lost the election and yet he still continued to put forth these allegations of fraud that weren't just allegations but that actually had impact and that um, 
you know, sought to delay and impede the transfer of power right up until the day they were trying to get Mike Pence to stop that certification of the electoral votes on January 6th. So this, so it's it's not right. We, we've been shorthanding this for a long time as the January 6th investigation. But it's not even clear at the end of the day that this investigation, this, this potential indictment, will try to connect Donald Trump to the violence on January 6th. Mm. And it's not clear that it has to in order to make a thorough criminal case. Mr. Laura, final question to you. Ken speaks about how broad this probe likely is. What does that tell you about the possible strength of any case that may be coming against the former president? Well, you could understand why, in, in many ways, um, going after sort of the, the phony electors or even a fundraising scheme, uh, if you're Jack Smith and you want to be a little bit more conservative, I think um, makes a lot of sense. Whereas if he was going to try to go after him for sort of the things that he said um, on January 6th at the Ellipse, those have First Amendment implications, and that's a thornier case. And if you're worried about it getting tossed out, maybe you just go after a very narrow slice uh, if you think that that's a, a stronger case. And so what we, again, have to kind of wait and see what the actual charges are if that, in fact, comes to pass. But I, I think it makes a lot of sense that you could understand why he might lop off this issue um, of the, the fake um, electors and the certification and the efforts to uh, stop the transfer of power if he thinks that that's a stronger case than what the president actually said to allegedly inspire insurrectionists, which is what everyone, of course, was focused on on January 6th. All right, Laura Jarrett and Ken Delaney, and thank you both so much for your fantastic reporting, as always. We do have some breaking news to get to now in a different 2020 election interference investigation. Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel just announced her office charged 16 people with participating in a fake elector scheme to overturn the 2020 election. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley joins me now to break down this really significant development. So, Julia, what do we know? It, it is significant, Kristen. So we understand the Michigan Attorney General charged 16 people today in a very detailed indictment. It's just been released as we're coming on air, still looking through these details. But these people are being charged with felonies because they conspired in December of 2020 to go before the Senate in the state of Michigan and fraudulently say that they were duly elected by the people of Michigan mm -hmm. to represent their votes. As the state attorney general points out, Michigan voted for Joe Biden. But these people were going to sign papers. In fact, they did sign papers saying they were elected, saying that they were the rightful state electors when they were not, and they knew they were not, so that they could go forward to the Senate and present a different outcome, that Donald Trump had been elected by the state of Michigan. Uh, one of the things that's so striking about this, and correct me if I'm missing anything here, but the attorney general had initially essentially let this to the federal, to the DOJ and said, I'm going to leave this to federal investigators. And then this turn saying, no, I'm taking this back up and I'm going to handle this myself, expressing some frustration with the fact that the federal process was going too slow. Yeah, perhaps because we've seen so many of uh, what happened with the election get bundled in with other investigations, whether it be Jack Smith's investigation into January 6th, which is Trump's whole, every way that Trump tried to put his finger on the outcome of the 2020 election. Also, you have what's going on in Georgia. But I think that she looked at the evidence here and saw that these 16 people knowingly conspired and signed documents to say that they were people who they weren't, that they had not been voted for uh, and put up if, in these positions by the state of Michigan. And she's sending a message here. Broadly speaking, I mean, talk about that message, because as you point out, there is this ongoing grand jury investigation in Fulton County uh, in Georgia, in which they are looking to efforts to overturn the election there. And of course, Trump world is watching very closely to see if he will be implicated in that. I mean, what are the broader implications, Julia, of these other investigations that are still underway? And as we await to see what happens with uh, the January 6th investigation. That's right. So based on that target letter, we may get more details on that soon. We expect the Georgia grand jury to issue a report in the first half of August. We're getting a lot more information about what happened in late 2020 in terms of how these states groups, people who vehemently supported the former president were conspiring and perhaps will be able to draw, to connect some of the dots and figure out that it was actually a national conspiracy. At this point, what the state attorney general in Michigan is laying out is specifically Michigan focused. But as we get more details, we can see the similarities here. And it's really eye opening. I know you know this as closely as you follow the election process, mm -hmm. but a lot of people don't realize that their ballots 
actually have to be certified by their state electors, people who are represented to carry out with how the state voted, but that the process can be manipulated mm. if there are people who try to step in and interrupt the way this process has been carried out for centuries. Well, as you say, this clearly is aimed at sending a message. Julia Ainsley, thank you for rushing down thank here you. with this breaking news. We really appreciate it. Coming up, we have new details emerging on how a U.S. soldier ended up in North Korean custody after willfully crossing the demilitarized zone without authorization. Plus, Republican lawmakers lash out at special counsel Jack Smith as he ramps up his criminal investigation into efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We're also following breaking news today from the Korean Peninsula. A U.S. soldier is being detained in North Korea after crossing into the country while on a tour of the demilitarized zone, the heavily fortified area separating North and South Korea. According to a U.S. official, that soldier broke away from the tour group and bolted into North Korea. This afternoon, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin reacted to the news, confirming the soldier, quote, willfully and without authorization crossed into North Korea, where he was taken into custody. He added the Pentagon is closely monitoring and investigating the situation. Joining me now is Courtney Cuby. Courtney, thanks so much for being here. Uh, this is an extraordinary situation. What more do we know about the situation and about this individual? And I got to say, Kristen, each new detail about this makes it even more extraordinary unusual. So this is a U.S. soldier. He found himself in some sort of a disciplinary trouble with the U.S. military in Korea. In fact, it was to the point where the South Korean government had detained him. It was some sort of a violation of the Status of Forces Agreement. Now, of course, that's the agreement that dictates how the U.S. military can live and work and operate in another country. He violated that in some way. The U.S. decided to deal with this they were going to put him on a plane at the commercial airport there in Korea and send him back to the U.S. Well, somehow he slipped away out of the airport. He joined up with this commercial tour group that went to the DMZ. While he was there, according to witnesses and U.S. officials we've spoken with, he took off across the border right into North Korean army hands. He's now in their custody. Yeah, it, it's just remarkable. And of course, we talked about the fact that the defense secretary got some questions about this earlier today. He talked about the fact that there is the utmost concern for this individual. But does the U.S. have a position on someone who's willfully detained? I mean, how does this get resolved? There's obviously an immense amount of urgency to try to get this person back. Absolutely, because if you look at the more, most recent past, we had this, the, the college student, Otto Warmbier, who was taken into custody by the North Koreans and ended up being in such terrible medical condition by the time he was actually released. He died soon after returning to the U.S. So absolutely, there's an urgency. Now, it's interesting the word that's being used here, willfully, that he willfully moved across. The officials I'm speaking with say the reason that they're using that word is they want to make it very clear to the North Korean government that he was not for any reason sent across the border on some sort of a spy mission. Now, that is because they want to keep him safe. If, in fact, the North Korean government or the military thought that he was there as a spy, well, that could definitely put him into a real jeopardy, and it would have a real impact on any efforts to try to get him released. We know that the U.S. and the North Korean government have had some sort of communications about this since it, occur mm. since it occurred, but we don't really know what level that's occurring or if there's been any resolution with the U.S. officials I'm speaking with, though, are saying that there's a real urgency to try to resolve this peacefully and quickly, Kristen. And, Court, just taking a step back, big picture here, what are the implications uh, for the U.S. and its approach to North Korea? Obviously, tensions have only been mounting. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, it just and just to give you a sense of how the situation there continues to be tense, just today, the U.S. military, for the first time since the 1980s, sent a nuclear-capable submarine to South Korea, to the naval base in Busan, which is in the southern part of the Korean peninsula. So it gives you a real sense. Recently, North Korea launched an, a solid-fueled intercontinental ballistic missile. There is both sides. There is this back and forth militarily. The tensions are certainly high. The real concern here, though, is if the North Koreans try to make the case that this U.S. soldier was some sort of a of a spy mm. sent on behalf of the U.S. government, I mean, this, this situation could really escalate quickly 
and his safety, security, and life, frankly, could be in real jeopardy here. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Uh, court, quickly, before I let you go, obviously we saw former President Trump engage in direct diplomacy with Kim Jong-un. Uh, that did not shift North Korea's uh, approach to its saber rattling. The Biden administration has taken a different approach. Uh, where does that stand and how do the two contrast? So, I mean, if you talk to U.S. officials, they say they are still willing to talk to North Korea. But you got to look at what's been happening just in the last year, maybe year and a half. North Korea has ratcheted up its missile tests. I mean, to an unprecedented level. Just last week, again, this ICBM test, that is a real game changer. If they can show the ability to launch a solid fueled intercontinental ballistic missile, what that means is the U.S. has virtually no time warning before they launch. A liquid-fueled rocket means that they ha the North Koreans have to take it out to the launch pad, stand it up, and then fuel it. When you're talking about an ICBM, that can take a day or two. The U.S. has the ability through satellites and spy technology to be able to see it sitting on that launch pad and to know there's the potential for a real launch here. With a solid fuel rocket, they roll it out to the pad, mm. they stand it up, they fire it. They has, there's very little notice. So when you look at things like that, the fact that the IAEA says that North Korea has reopened one of its nuclear testing sites, yeah. I mean, there, there's been a real uptick in their military movement in the last year, and it's not really clear why that is, Kristen. Yeah, I know. We're all watching it very closely. Courtney Kibbe, great reporting and analysis as always. Thank you for joining us on a very busy day for you. We appreciate it. Thanks, Kristen. Up next, Ron DeSantis criticizes the former president for his inaction on January 6th as the Florida governor stumps in South Carolina amid news of Trump's latest legal peril. We're live on the campaign trail and with the panel. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. This morning, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis became the first Republican candidate to file for South Carolina's Republican primary. The filing campaign event and a press conference marked something of an unofficial reset of his campaign, which has been off to an uneven start since its launch. At the event, NBC's Gabe Gutierrez asked DeSantis for his reaction to the latest looming indictment facing former President Trump. Listen. There's a difference between being brought up on criminal charges and, and doing things like, for example, um, I think it was shown how he was in the White House and didn't do anything while, while things were going on. Uh, he should have come out more forcefully, of, of course that. But to try to criminalize that, that's a, diff that's a different issue entirely. And I think that we, we want to be in a situation where, you know, you don't have one side just constantly trying to put the other side in jail. And, and that, unfortunately, is, is uh, what we're seeing now. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins me now from Columbia, South Carolina. Gabe, fantastic job getting the governor to respond there. And of course, he said he should have come out more forcefully. What, what do you make of his response and what that tells us about this potential reset he's trying to pull off? Well, Kristen, good afternoon. And yes, this was the governor's most forceful comments on what former President Trump, in his view, should have done on January 6th. The fact that he said that he was in the White House and didn't do anything, that he should have come out more forcefully. He's never quite gone that far before. However, he's still trying to walk that fine line by saying that uh, the former president didn't do what he should have on January 6th, but at the same time that he should not be criminally prosecuted for it. And in an interview just within the last few minutes, you know, he has said that he doesn't believe that the former president should be charged, that it wouldn't be good for the country. But this is all part, as you said, of the uh, campaign's uh, reboot, if you will. It's been no secret that over the past several days, there have been reports, including from NBC News, showing that the campaign is burning cash at quite a high rate and that about a dozen staffers have been laid off. So uh, there is now a market shift shift in strategy, it seems, to uh, speak to a wider uh, part of the electorate here. But again, he is walking that fine line. Still, those comments that you just played have already drawn a strong reaction from uh, former President Trump's campaign team, uh, calling it um, a disqualifying take from an unserious candidate. That reaction coming just within the past a few hours. But again, the most, um, the furthest that uh, Governor DeSantis has gone in attacking the former president over January 6th, but still saying he should not be criminally prosecuted, Kristen. Gabe, I think you really hit the nail on the head, which is that even though he's sharpening his tone, he's still walking this incredibly fine line. He clearly doesn't want to alienate 
Trump supporters. There he is in South Carolina. To what extent is he going to be focused on South Carolina, obviously uh, the first primary in the South? And, and do you anticipate, do you have any reporting that he's going to sharpen his tone as he gets closer to the first debate? Well, look, and we've been speaking about what Governor DeSantis would do with regards to his attacks on the former president even before he announced his campaign, right? There was the expectation that he would sharpen those attacks once he formally became a candidate. Well, that was some time ago, and he's only done it marginally. Now, according to a, a strategy memo obtained by NBC News last week, what the campaign is really trying to do is trying to focus on policy in the upcoming weeks. They've already rolled out their immigration policy today in South Carolina. He rolled out his military policy mm -hmm. and plans to roll out some foreign policy policy proposals over the coming weeks, including related to China, all looking forward to that first debate in late August. But Kristen, as you know, it is an incredible challenge to try and go to try and go up against the Trump media machine, if you will, with these latest developments in this uh, in his legal hurdles. It has basically overshadowed any of the of Governor DeSantis's policy proposals that he was trying to roll out today, Kristen. Well, again, Gabe, you got the soundbite of the day there with DeSantis really sharpening his tone, saying that former President Trump should have come out more forcefully on January 6th. So very well done. Thank you so much. And it's no surprise, but some of Donald Trump's most ardent supporters on Capitol Hill are defending him ahead of what could be his third round of indictments. Take a listen. We have yet again another example of Joe Biden's weaponized Department of Justice targeting his top political opponent, Donald Trump. And this week, I want to highlight our oversight work on this two-tiered, fundamentally un-American system of justice. Why are they doing everything they can to prevent him from being on the ballot in 2024? I'll tell you why. Because Donald Trump will win in 2024. And the left just, they're, they're scared. He's coming back and he's going to win. He's going to win. He's going to be the 47th president. That's absolute bull. Yeah, that's my reaction. Um, this is the only way that the Democrats have to beat President Trump is to arrest him, smear him, charge him with ridiculous charges, all in a cover up of Joe Biden's crimes, Hunter Biden's crimes. It's, it's unbelievable. Some curse words that needed to be beeped out there. Joining me on set is my panel, Olivia Beavers, congressional reporter at Politico, Eugene Robinson, columnist at The Washington Post and an NBC News political analyst, and Rick Tyler, Republican strategist and also an NBC News political analyst. Thanks to all of you for joining me on a very busy day. Olivia, let me start with you. Uh, look, basically, we're hearing what we expect to hear from folks on Capitol Hill. You are seeing Ron DeSantis sharpen his tone just a tiny bit. Is anything different about this potential third indictment than the first two, do you think? I mean, I think that we've been expecting this to happen. House Republicans have been preparing. And some recent reporting that my colleague just did was that Donald Trump called Speaker McCarthy and uh, the conference chair, Elise Stefanik, to talk about going on the offense about this. So it's going to be adding to the indictments, but they want to say that um, this is Democrats targeting him ahead of 2024 and making that into a campaign message. The one other thing that I think was interesting, I was trying to ask some DeSantis supporters on Capitol Hill mm. about what they thought. And Chip Roy said, well, the truth needs to be pursued, which I thought was a little bit cryptic, but it just goes to show these campaigns have had a hard time figuring out how to handle these indictments because a lot of polling shows, it doesn't really move Republican voters. Um, our magazine had a polling, a polling recently where 41% of Republicans said it had no impact on their mm. views about Donald Trump. We don't know if this one's going to be different, but so far, they're not really moving them. Rick, p pick up on that point, because Olivia, I think, it hits the seminal point that it's not moving voters. And Republican candidates still don't know exactly how to respond to this. You can see Ron DeSantis struggling with this in real time. It's not moving voters because, forgive me, but Ron DeSantis pulled another dull knife out of the drawer mm. because the idea that... What Ron DeSantis needed to do is to do something and to act more forcefully, which he didn't do. He became Donald Trump's defense attorney in that, in, in that press conference. He's defending the president. Why doesn't Ron DeSantis point out the record of Donald Trump while he was in office? Three million dollars, three million jobs lost, a uh, mismanagement of COVID, making uh, Fauci the president uh, for a full year under mismanagement 
uh, of COVID, for not controlling the border, it's worse than it was today, for increasing the trade deficit with China, it's worse than today, for increasing the debt of the United States government by $7 trillion. I mean, this is unbelievable. Talk about his record. That's the only way you're going to beat him. It's unbelievable. Do you agree, Eugene? Should he be talking uh, yeah, about I his agree. record and, and, and his I, attacks? Well, first of all, I congratulate Gabe for getting that soundbite mm-hmm. from DeSantis. Um, and, uh, but sharpening is not the word I would use, <laughs> actually, <laughs> because it was not sharp. It was just, it point. was the, it I may was have the overstated tiniest that. little love <laughs> tap. We look for tiny gradations. No, here. I understand. Tiny, teensy, I mean, for DeSantis, right, it was, it was a giant leap, but it was the tiniest little love tap. And what does the Trump tap camp come back with? They come back with bazookas. This is yeah. disqualifying. This is horrible. This is terrible. You're not going to beat Donald Trump unless you at least try to beat Donald Trump. You're just not going to do it by defending him. I want to play a little bit of sound from Mitch McConnell, uh, who talked about uh, the Senate acquitting Trump at a second impeachment trial. Let's take a look at that and do some reaction on the other side. President Trump is still liable for everything he did while he was in office as an ordinary citizen. Unless the statute of limitations is run, still liable for everything he did while he was in office. Didn't get away with anything yet. Yet. We have a criminal justice system in this country. We have civil litigation. And former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. Rick, we played that soundbite because there was Leader McConnell saying, look, we have a justice system. And now the justice system is taking action. And Trump supporters, former President Trump, are attacking the very justice system that McConnell there is saying, look, that's why the justice system is set up. 223 years of peaceful transfer of power was destroyed by one person. We should be the envy of the world. Every American, Democrat, Independent, Republican, should have been should be proud of that record. That was all destroyed through Donald Trump's ego and the fact that he couldn't handle the fact that he lost. And so what they're going to do is undermine all these institutions that have served us well. Are they, are they imperfect? Yes. Will they be imperfect? Because humans occupy them. But... Uh, Mitch McConnell is right. He understands that we have to preserve the institutions, we have to seek justice, and ultimately citizens will decide Donald Trump's fate. He, he is no less liable to his conduct and criminality than any other American citizen, and that's fundamental to our system. Eugene, I hear you agree. No, amen. I mean, amen. It's true. <laughs> this is the way the, the way the law works. Mitch McConnell said it very well. And now that is playing out. And so why are all these Republicans complaining about what is actually supposed to happen? No one is supposed to be above the law. Olivia, it's so interesting because, of course, if former President Trump had been convicted, he would not be able to run again. What are you hearing on the Hill? Is there any chatter? Is there any regret? I've been talking to some Republicans who say this is complicated stuff. They're still wrestling with their votes on that day, aren't they? So I was uh, in the evacuation off the House floor that day, and I remember talking to Republicans that day, the weeks after, and I watched the entire shift. So it started with Donald Trump will never be able to recover from this, and I don't think that the people who are telling me that were ever expecting him to be able to rise up and become the party nominee. Mm-hmm. And so some of them were quiet about their their criticisms, and I think that they're glad for it because some of them I've seen go off and endorse him. Some of them are privately telling me that they don't support him, and then they go and they endorse him. So what you're seeing privately is different publicly, mm-hmm. and I think that the party is now starting to move even more towards Donald Trump. January 6th is in the back of their mind, and there's an entire different view that they share publicly about that day versus what we saw right after. Yeah, Eugene. I, I will just point out that these are public servants who hold public office, and they ought to be able but to say not publicly. Compl- it's not complicated. It, it, I mean, exactly. Forget about the policy. Just look at the raw politics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Donald Trump lost the House, lost the Senate, lost the White House. Politically, loser, loser, loser. I mean, I don't get it. Well, what's interesting is I've spoken to a number of Democrats who say, and, and Eugene, let me put this to you, that... Trump is the best person in a general election because they look at some of the polling around President Biden, around oh. Vice President Harris. I mean, what do you? Is there a I, real risk in that type of narrative? Because we saw it. I do not believe Trump. I, I, I believe the record of all the elections after 2016 demonstrates that Donald Trump is not 
the best person to lead the Republican Party to victory. We'll because... lose the House. All right. I want to pause the conversation briefly to turn to another piece of 2024 news. Last night, West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin headlined an event in New Hampshire with the political group No Labels, which is weighing running a presidential ticket next year if they are unsatisfied with the Democratic and Republican nominees. Manchin praised the group last night in New Hampshire. Listen to what he had to say. We're here to make sure that the American people have an option. And the option is, can you move the political parties off their respective sides? They've gone too far right and too far left. When asked, Manchin would not take being on that potential ticket off the table. NBC's Von Hilliard spoke with No Label CEO Nancy Jacobson, and he joins me now. So what were your key takeaways from that conversation, Vaughn? And thanks for coming back for us. Right. And Kristen, I think you actually hit at the heart of one of those major questions yesterday in your conversation with former Republican North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory. And that was around the rather secret deliberations that this group is undertaking. They've got $70 million nearly that they have in their war chest to get ballot access for this potential no labels ticket around the country. Yet they're not revealing their donors. They say they're not a party, even though they are technically registering as a party in several states here. And yet there are so many questions around the deliberations over who they are seeking to try to recruit. Is it Joe Manchin? Is it John Huntsman? Is it Larry Hogan? Those are some of the questions. But the, the second question that uh, a lot of the voters have on their minds is the extent to which that third party ticket could potentially spoil the election for either Joe Biden or for mm -hmm. Donald Trump even. I want to let you listen to part of my exchange with her about that very question. If the public doesn't want these choices, we will then offer the line because that line can win. And, you know, uh, nobody knows. I know there's a lot of talk about this spoiling, but nobody knows who the candidates are. How can we know who spoils for who or what or what side? Because nobody knows what the candidates are. Would, you, would no labels end its effort if the Republican nominee is not Donald Trump? I think the, the, what we stay true to is if the American people want a choice and uh, they, uh, on both sides, it looks like they don't want the choices that they're given. So there is a path for victory to not spoil, but to win. No labels would uh, offer the ballot line to a ticket to go off and run and win. The only way this ballot gets offered to a ticket is if it doesn't spoil and it wins. But how do you know that, though? You, I mean, we... we I mean, this we, is high stakes. Donald Trump is on the ballot, and as somebody who is a Democrat yourself, you, and, you, and, and your team has even expressed concerns about a Donald Trump presidency. What are the metric points to know that you guys would not? And listen, you, we're going to we're going to know the national sentiment, the national mood by that point. Kristen, I can't say that I walked away from that interviewing interview having any better idea come next spring if it is Donald Trump and Joe Biden who are the respective party's nominees, whether no labels will go forward or not. And from your conversation with Pat McCrory and my conversation with Joe Manchin yesterday, the folks who are aligned with this organization are having a tough time putting that marker down. So I think that there is uh, going to be a lot of follow up questions in the months ahead about well, whether we're going to see this. What could be a potential major third party effort actually take place? Yeah, it's just fascinating. And, and it was just a great interview that you did there. Vaughn, thank you so much for bringing it to us. We really appreciate Thanks, it. Great reporting. Let me bring my panel back and turn to you, Olivia. Mm -hmm. No Label says they're not going to make a decision until April. There is a lot of hand-wringing, particularly yeah. within the Democratic yeah. Party and, frankly, a little bit within the Republican Party, too, because it's not entirely clear mm -hmm. what a third-party candidate would mean. What are you hearing about the key concerns around a third-party candidate? Well, I think that Richard Gephardt has this group that's supposed to counter mm -hmm. no labels. There is fear that basically a moderate independent will be detracting from President Biden and clear the way for Donald Trump. And so that's their argument is you're helping someone that you don't agree with end up potentially back in office. Um, but also, if you look at it, we have Cornell West running as a mm -hmm. Green Party candidate. And if you look at 2016, Democrats blame Jill Stein for basically being the one who pulled the votes away from Hillary Clinton. So that, I think, is where you're also seeing a lot of angst coming back is, will they hurt Biden will, or, or just help Trump? Yeah. Eugene, if you talk to folks within No Labels, Senator Manchin has said this is an insurance policy. And yet, in modern history, there's no <laughs> real example, unless I'm mistaken, yeah. please correct me if I am, yeah. of a third party candidate winning. 
being anything no. other than a spoiler. No, that's a third party candidate uh, is not going to win, is not going to get electoral votes, is... And if it's a, a you know some sort of moderate centrist, um, no label the candidate, it's going to help Donald Trump if it's Trump and Biden. I mean, I, th I think that's very clear. Um, so they should face that. I mean, if they should own that, if that's what no labels is going to do. And my second question, though, is who gave the green light to this new season of the Joe Manchin show? Right? <laughs> I guess we haven't been paying enough attention to him. Joe Manchin did. Joe Manchin did. We haven't been and paying enough attention to him. Yeah. Um, for a while, and so I guess we will now. Well, uh, Rick, it's such a great point because there has been so much focus on Senator Manchin, whether it be how is he going to vote on a key piece of legislation or now. And he is really quite firm in this moment that there is an appetite for a third party. They point to the fact that more than 60% of Americans say they don't like President Biden or former President Trump as a candidate. And he makes the case, look, Americans deserve to have another choice. I mean, does he have a point? Yeah, sure. But Teddy Roosevelt made Woodrow Wilson president and Ross Perot made Bill Clinton <laughs> president. And that's what's going to happen. And, but look, third parties are fine. Thousands of them have come and gone. And uh, since the Republic, birth of the Republic, none of them made a difference in the presidential race. But this one is particularly stupid because mm. People are uniting under this uh, this label, it's a label, of no labels, which the reason they can't give you any answers to anything is they don't believe in anything, because what they want to do is assemble two people that two have a fundamentally different view of government. So are they a high-tax party or the low-tax party, the big government party or the, or the pro-life party, the anti the, the dog-leash party, the anti-dog-leash party? They don't, they don't know, because it's never going to happen, because they don't stand for anything, <laughs> and it's just dumb and pathetic, and all it's going to do is make Donald Trump president. All right, we will leave it there. And I do think you raise a really critical point, which is that they did put out a policy booklet, but it does contain very few details. So part of our job as reporters is to get some more details about it. Thank you so much for a great conversation, Olivia, Eugene, and Rick. And still to come, classified documents, controversies, and what they mean for the future of protecting and preserving U.S. history, including some of the nation's most sensitive secrets. We'll have my interview with the first female head of the National Archives. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we track developments in the Trump special counsel investigation on efforts to overturn the 2020 election, the former president, of course, already faces federal criminal charges in the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case. Trump's indictment over mishandling and retaining classified documents has thrust the often overlooked U.S. National Archives into the public spotlight. I recently spoke to the agency's newly confirmed director, Colleen Shogan. Let's start off by talking about the fact that a NARA official testified back in March that every administration going back to Reagan, and including the current president, the former president, the former vice president, has had issues, has mismanaged classified documents. Does the system need an overhaul? Well, we are working within the laws that we have now, the Presidential Records Act, the Federal Records Act. Uh, we have over 13.5 billion pieces of paper at the National Archives. And we have had, every day we have very, very good compliance with the law. So I don't think it needs an overhaul. We do need to bring attention to the importance of handling classified information and also handling federal records. What do you think is the crux of the issue, though? Why have administrations, going back to the Reagan administration, mishandled classified documents, our nation's most mm -hmm. sensitive secrets? Is there a lack of communication with NARA and these administrations? Are administrations failing to get the message? Where do you see the breakdown here? I don't think that there's a misunderstanding or a lack of uh, communication. I think that simply life at the White House is busy and hectic. Uh, imagine what your day is like and imagine being the president of the United States. Uh, and so there, there may be mistakes or errors that happen. We're human beings. There's always going to be mistakes or errors. As long as that information, as long as those mistakes and errors are corrected, as long as that information comes back to the American people, that's what the National Archives is concerned about. Former President Trump has claimed that he had two years to turn over um, presidential material to the National Archives. NARA 
put out a statement saying that that was not the case. Mr. Trump is also arguing that, look, some of these documents are his personal records. Under the Presidential Records Act, it states that, yes, presidents can have personal records, but they need to turn over official documents. Is there a misrepresentation by the former president, by his team, about what's actually in the Presidential Records Act here? I think the Presidential Records Act is clear. There is a definition of what constitutes a presidential record versus a, a personal record. And all those records are under control of the president of the United States until his or her term of office is over. And then those records become the property of the United States in custody from the National Archives. So when former President Trump says that he was entitled to hold on to these documents under the Presidential Records Act, what say you? I say that there's a legal process and the Department of Justice is handling uh, this, this debate and we will see what happens. Broadly speaking, and you obviously went through a confirmation process, mm -hmm. has the political pressure, has the political spotlight been turned up on the National Archives in the wake of these cases that we've been talking about? Absolutely. I think that there's more attention, more people know about the National Archives than ever before. We've been in the news. I'm sitting here with you on Meet the Press. I don't think any of my predecessors uh, would have done that. Uh, but I think that's also an opportunity because we can talk about presidential records. We can talk about the current uh, controversies concerning uh, President Trump with Vice President Biden's records, Vice President Pence's records. But there's also a larger story about what the National Archives does, which is preserves our nation's history. Well, and that takes me to my next question. Mm -hmm. How do you see your role? How do you see your charge every day when you go into work? Uh, we are the agency that is preserving our nation's history and also sharing that history with the American people. We protect, we preserve, and we provide access to those records. That is our mission. It's very clear. And in everything we do at the National Archives, that is our goal. Do you see it as part of your mission, given this broader conversation that we're having, to turn down the partisan temperature mm -hmm. around the National Archives, around the work that you do? Mm -hmm. And are there ways that you think you and your team can do that? Absolutely. Uh, the National Archives is a nonpartisan federal agency. We are an independent federal agency that's part of the executive branch. I have a very strong background in working in nonpartisan uh, political agencies, such as the Congressional Research Service, the Library of Congress. And what I will be doing uh, as the head of the National Archives is talking about that and also walking the walk. Uh, we will be following the law. We will be following the law objectively uh, as a, uh, with no attention to partisanship or political bias. And just by doing that and by executing the law, I think we will be on the right track. And just finally, what is it that you want people to know about the National Archives that you think is getting missed in all of these discussions that mm -hmm. we are having? There's a, there's a lot. We have the presidential records are incredibly important. We have a lot of other records throughout American history. Uh, we have over 250 million records that are in our catalog on our website, nara.gov. So please come and visit us either in person here in Washington, D.C., or come visit us online and explore American history and learn something about our shared heritage and culture. All right, we will leave it there. Colleen Shogan, thank you so much for the great discussion and congratulations. Thank you. Such a fascinating conversation with, again, the first woman ever to hold that role. That does it for us this hour. We are back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.